Hey, welcome to the channel, where I review and test gear from a bike packer's perspective. And today, I'm going to be reviewing a bunch of gear from Red Shift Sports. So let's get into it. I don't claim to be the creator, but I'm a savior. I take the strange variables of human life and make something out of a crazy quilt that saves hundreds of lives. Over the last few months, I've been testing Redshift's shock top suspension stem, the shock top suspension seat post, as well as a set of their kitchen sink handlebars paired with the cruise control tops and drop grips, and they're laced in the really long bar tape. The kitchen sink bars are made from aluminum and are available in four widths between 44 and 53 centimeters. I've opted for the 53 centimeter bars as I ride an extra large bike. All versions of the bars have a 7 degree sweep back, the tops have a 20 millimeter rise, and the drops have a 25 degree flare. An optional endurance loop can be added to achieve an aerodynamic riding position and to gain additional mounting points. I've had a really positive experience with these bars so far. I love them, and I would highly recommend them if you're considered getting a set. I'm really digging the width of the bars, which provides a bit more added control, especially when going downhill in the drops. With respect to the cruise control drop grips, I didn't find myself using them very much. Perhaps it's my riding style, but when I'm going downhill, especially on a rough gravel road with lots of potholes, I want my fingers to be closer to the brakes, which requires your hands to be further in on the drops. I found that I never really used them much unless I was on a paved road. They're comfy, don't get me wrong, I just didn't have much use for them. The 7 degree back sweep on the bars is a really nice touch, and when paired with the top grips, provides a very comfy riding position when climbing with your hands on the tops. The top grips are a bit squishy, resulting in greater comfort, and I've really been enjoying using them. They can be added to any set of handlebars, and I would definitely recommend picking up a pair. I would also recommend picking up a set of the really long bar tape. At 315 centimeters long, it's over 50% longer than normal bar tape, which means it can accommodate the endurance loop. The tape has a thickness of 3 centimeters, which is about average compared to other tapes. I found them to have a good dexterity and feel, and performed well at dampening the vibrations on the road. I would also recommend spending the extra $50 on the endurance loop. While I doubt that I'm gaining anything in terms of aerodynamics, considering I'm riding with a full bikepacking setup, I love having the option for additional hand positions just to switch things up and help stretch out my back. The additional space for mounting accessories in the endurance loop is useful to also have while bikepacking. But with that being said, the 31.8mm stem clamp diameter is too wide to fit the mounting bracket for my Crew 2 GPS unit. The endurance loop itself has a diameter of 23.8mm, which is too narrow for the mounting bracket. Not a big deal, but something you should probably know before purchasing if you really want to utilize the space for mounting. For a quick fix, I just wrapped a piece of old tube around the top of the endurance bar and wrapped it in tape. On my first field tests, I had some issues with instability when using a 10 liter dry bag on the front packed with my sleeping system. Riding in the endurance bar in the aero position resulted in a fair bit of shaking that could only be resolved if I pressed on the front tire really hard into the ground. On subsequent trips, I decided to pack a little bit less in the front bars and didn't have any more issues with instability. So perhaps it's my tendency to overpack, or maybe my bag just wasn't securely strapped. I'm not sure, but once again, something you might want to consider before purchasing. My only other recommendation for improving the kitchen sink handlebars would be to have different options for the degree of flare in the drops. The old bars on my bike had a 35 degree flare, and I really like that for steep descents. Having a bit more flare in these bars would, in my opinion, make them the perfect bar, but they're pretty damn close. The shock top suspension stem uses elastomers to provide up to 20 millimeters of travel to smooth out bumps and rocks on the road, thereby reducing fatigue and strain. Redshift claims that it reduces shock and vibrations up to 70% that of a traditional stem. The stem comes with five swappable elastomers to fine tune your riding style based on your weight. I've been testing an 80 millimeter version of the suspension stem over the last few months, but I've actually been using a 90 millimeter version on my bike for the last two years. I'm happy to see that a shorter 80mm version was released, because I have a ridiculously unproportionate body and would benefit from a shorter stem. The shock top does a really great job at cutting out all the small imperfections in the roads, and I would highly recommend if you find your arms or upper body get very fatigued from riding on rough terrain, it's one of those things that you really don't know is working until you ride without one. At the same time, it isn't a substitute for front suspension if you are riding on mountain bike trails. It's more suited for smoothing out small imperfections than big rocks. When it comes to bike packing, I would suggest it's better to fine tune the settings up one setting from the suggested weight to make it a bit more firm. 
For example, I use the elastomers for the settings between 185 to 200 pounds, rather than the 150 pounds to 185 pounds. I'm sure there probably isn't that much of a difference, but I find it works better for me when I have a handlebar bag attached to the front. Overall, I would highly recommend using the shock top suspension stem for bikepacking, especially if you're riding on really rough terrain for multiple days. I've noticed a significant reduction in fatigue in my upper body and an increase in overall ride comfort. The shock top suspension seat post is a tunable seat post that uses a pivot system to provide up to 35 millimeters of rear travel. Similar to the suspension stem, Redshift claims that it reduces shock and vibrations up to 60% that of a normal seat post. A set of two springs can be used to make adjustments to the stiffness of the seat post. The preload plug can be fine-tuned to find your optimal stiffness. For a more softer, comfortable ride, riders should use only the large main spring and then fine-tune the preload plug based on your weight. For a more firmer performance feel, include the smaller spring inside the main spring and once again fine-tune the preload plug. Turn the plug clockwise to further insert the plug to increase firmness, or turn it counterclockwise to remove the plug and increase softness. After playing around with various combinations of springs and preload tensions, I landed on a preference for the firmer performance feel, with a slightly softer preload tension to account for the additional weight on the back from the seat post bag. As far as compatibility of seat post bags go, you should be able to use any bag that doesn't use a dedicated rack or clamp. In other words, something that attaches just to the saddle or to the post. I was able to successfully install my Mr. Fusion seat post bag, which uses a dedicated rack on the seat post without any issues, but I wasn't able to install my new Arkel seat packer bag, which attaches to the seat post rails. So if you're thinking of purchasing a shock top suspension post, but want to use a saddle bag for bike packing, keep in mind the compatibility of dedicated racks. Personally, I only bike pack with a dedicated rigid rack for my seat post bag for two reasons. One, to reduce any tail sway, which I find pretty annoying when riding. And two, a rigid system makes it easier and safer to affix items to the seat post bag. For example, I bike pack 900 kilometers up here on Vancouver Island with a fishing rod attached to my Mr. Fusion. At the end of the day, from a bike packing perspective, it could be a trade-off between the comfort that the seat post is gonna provide you with the limitations of the type of bag that you can use. I'd like to speak a bit about my riding experience as well. Much of the gravel terrain where I live is steep, and the roads themselves can be in pretty rough shape. I found that the seat post resulted in a fair bit of pedal bob when I was climbing on steep gravel roads. Since I'm biking at fairly low speeds, it didn't really feel like it was increasing my comfort level. When descending, I tend to lift my butt out of the saddle and lean back in a more traditional mountain bike style descent, so I really didn't get any of the advantages of the seat post when going downhill. For the kind of bikepacking that I do, I don't really see myself using the suspension seat post on an ongoing basis as there's only marginal gains in comfort. With that being said, your experience may vary with the suspension seat post and there may be situations when you would benefit from the additional comfort. For example, if you have back issues, if you get easily fatigued when you're riding on gravel roads, or perhaps you have narrower tires. I ride 2.25 inch mountain bike tires with a tubeless setup, so I imagine those are providing a pretty good level of suspension anyway. If you have thicker tires, then the marginal gains may not be there for a suspension seat post. I have found a good use for the shock top suspension seat post on my fixed gear commuter bike, which has 27 millimeter tires. Since I'm constantly having to pedal on this bike and there's no opportunity to coast, I find that the seat post is really helpful with smoothing out the roads, especially with the narrower tires. All right, so that's the end of the review. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.